Hey guys, welcome to Talking Strongman. As you can see, I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Rob Kearney. It's a pleasure to have you on. I think we've all been a bit worried about you the last uh, few weeks. You kind of scared everyone. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, first time hearing it, Rob has had um, testicular cancer. Bit of a shock. This, you know, I, I've, I've been watching you this year. You were meant to be going to World's Strongest Man as the alternate, um, which was just ridiculous anyway. You should have been there regardless. But, um, you know, you were down as the reserve. Then you decided not to go to Worlds. You had some, you know, I think you had an opportunity with um, Gymshark. Is that right? No, it was actually a, a TV show. Oh, a TV show. Brilliant. Yeah, we can get into that too. Yeah, I want to hear all about it. But the, the, the last thing I saw, you know, looking on, on your Instagram, suddenly you're, in, you're being rushed into hospital. Talk to us, man. What's been happening? Yeah, you know... <laughs> The, the past uh, the past eight or nine months have been kind of shitty, I guess is the best way to put it, right? You know, starting off with the tricep tendon rupture back in October, uh, you know, rehab for that luckily has been going really well. And it was about, I would say about two months ago is when I kind of started noticing um, some symptoms, I guess is the best way to put it. So kind of walk you through what happened. Um, I was prepping for Worlds. Everything was going really well had a heavy squat and deadlift session on one day and was wearing a deadlift suit and a squat suit. And the next day I noticed some, some, some pain in my right testicle and it was kind of going up into my abdomen. I was like, Oh, this is kind of weird, but honestly just kind of chalked it up to being in two different suits the day before. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not unusual for them to sort of ride up and that, that, for, for yeah. anyone who's not worn a deadlift or squat suit, bloody uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. They're terrible. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I, I was in the shower later that evening, and I just decided to feel around and kind of just see if everything was where it needed to be, I guess the best way to put it. And I noticed there was one section that seemed a little bit hard. Okay. Um, and was kind of like, okay, this it doesn't feel the same as the other one, but... I won't think too much of it. And actually ended up having Joey feel it as well, because I didn't know if I was, you know, I think like with us being so in tune with our bodies, sometimes we become kind of hypochondriacs. And we're like, if we think we feel something, we, we automatically go to the worst case scenario, but he noticed it as well. So I actually had my physical for worlds coming up a few weeks later and decided to just kind of put it off until then brought it up at the physical and it had actually grown in size um and up to that point so how, how big are we talking like um at that point i would say a little larger than a p but uh, an obvious so, growth from, from the few weeks before that was really nice yeah yeah um the best way to put it like the, the first thing i felt it felt like a like a string like a hard string yeah um so it wasn't like a mass it wasn't this ball it was just like a little hardening in a small section so when he noticed that, that's when we kind of started the process of getting some imaging and, and seeing what we're, what we're dealing with. So about two weeks go by and I go in for my ultrasound. And by then it had grown from the size of like a pea to about the size of a nickel. Um, so a decent amount of growth in a couple of weeks. And, you know, that day after the ultrasound, I, you know, my phone started ringing. It was my doctor's office. And I kind of knew at that point what the call was going to be. Um, you know, he said, you know, there's definitely a mass. Uh, they actually found three on, on that one testicle. And they were like, you know, we need to set you up with oncology. So definitely not a conversation or, or the words I was, ex, you know, expecting or hoping to hear. You know, anytime, anytime the C word is thrown around, it's extremely scary. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, got set up with a, with a great oncologist here, here in Washington in the, in the greater Seattle area. And I went for that appointment and pretty much because they don't, so they don't biopsy testicular cancer when there's a growth, they just remove the testicle. Mm -hmm. Um, and they did a really good job at saying it was cancer without saying it was cancer. Cause you can't definitively say it until it's been tested in a lab. Yeah. So walked into that appointment and, you know, Joey was there with me and they pretty much didn't give me any options. They said, Hey, here's what we're going to do. You're going to have surgery next week. We're going to take it out. Then we'll send it off to the lab and let you know what's going on. So, and that process moved along really quickly. So it was, it was a very, very strange and fast process. Um, you know, from the point of 
getting the ultrasound to oncology to a CT to surgery was only about two weeks. Wow. So it moved, to, it moved quick. Yeah. I mean, I, I know we've spoken, you know, away from camera, but um, Liz and myself, we, we lost her dad last year due to cancer and the treatment was so slow. Just it, it was frustratingly slow, to be honest, made even worse by the COVID situation. So to, to hear that it was so quick for you is actually great because these kind of things, the quicker you can treat them, the, the better it is. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that's kind of where their mindset was at, being a 29-year-old healthy male. Um, you know, having testicular cancer, there's a, it spreads extremely quickly, as I talked about just how big the yeah. mass got in such a short amount of time. And the thing with testicular cancer is if it does metastasize and spread, it typically tracks in the lymph nodes up the middle of the abdomen. So there's a really good chance of it spreading to other structures within the abdomen, which is, you know, you don't want to start messing with colon cancer or anything like that. So I think because of the rate of growth and, you know, the fact that I am healthy and they, they really wanted to try to get a move on it as quickly as possible because it also is, there's a really high chance of sterilization if you last, if had it last long, even if they're only removing one testicle. So, you know, the kind of the odds were in my favor, I guess, is, is a way to put it saying that, you know, everything stacked up to make them move along a little bit quicker. But that's good though, you know? Yeah. I mean, oh, it was great. Yeah. How are you feeling now? Obviously, how long has it been since surgery? A few about a week, is it? It's been just over a week. So it was Tuesday last week was a surgery. We're here Wednesday. So yeah, eight days. Um, I'm actually doing really well. It's uh, so I think a lot of people assume when, when you're getting a Tesco removed, they just, they just go through a sack, but that's actually not how they do it. Um, so they actually make an incision kind of on the pant line right? and then go down because they have to remove the testicle, epididymis, spermatic cord, all of that comes out. And um so, but the downside to that is they essentially create a hernia to get to everything, right? So they have to cut through the abdominals and all that stuff. So the recovery is a little bit longer. Um, you know, essentially I'm not allowed to do any physical activity besides walking for two weeks. Okay. Um, and then I can start doing some conditioning stuff, but no lifting greater than geez, 10 kilos uh, for, for six weeks. Uh, because especially with the amount of muscle that I have, the chance of bursting open the hernia repair is pretty high with me trying to pick up anything, even just like bearing down or contracting my abs. So we're being a little bit conservative, but you know, one thing that I've learned in the past year or so is, is patience is okay when dealing with injuries and I'm not going to rush to get into anything. You know, it, it is a bummer because I did have two big shows lined up in September with America's Strongest Man and then World's Ultimate Strongman. Um, but, you know, looking at the bigger picture, I'd, I'd rather pull it back a little bit, make sure I take this recovery nice and seriously, and then, you know, hit it hard for the road in, uh, in October. I, I'm so glad to see like a lot of you younger guys being smart with, with recovery these days. Us older boys were stupid. You know, we were like, <laughs> let's get back lifting as quick as possible. But I've spoken to a few, you know, people that have injured themselves recently, or I mean, in your case, surgery, obviously, but, but seeing people like um, Lissis take his time, Kiliuszkowski, as much as I know he wants to compete, he's taking his time. And, um, you know, there's others as well that you have to understand if you're going to be in this for the long haul, you can't just rush back and it's, you know, it is important. Absolutely. And that's, that's especially, you know, I think, you know, even though I'm fortunate enough that, that the testicular, you know, testicular cancer is extremely curable and, you know, the success rates are super high. Anytime you're kind of faced to force your mortality, it, it gives you a little bit of a different outlook and, you know, I'm not saying that I was ever, you know, close to death, but, hearing the word cancer is, is terrifying and it's being diagnosed scary. with it is scary, regardless of what stage it's at. And I think that has certainly put a new perspective on how I'm going to kind of treat things going forward as far as competing and, and how I'm going to treat my body and kind of the goals that I set for myself. You know, It's kind of this. funny because I'm, I'm sat here talking to you and just from the athlete background that I have, in my head, I know you're coming back. So it's not even an it's, it's not even an issue, but I'm sure some people are watching, thinking, "Why is Loz not more concerned?" <laughs> <You know>? Like <laughs> a normal person won't think the way we think. 
No, I mean, you know, for me, it's, I've never been one to step down from an obstacle. That's for sure. You know, throughout my entire career. And this is just another hurdle that I have to go over. Um, and, you know, I'm happy enough that I can, I can share my experience with everybody and hopefully open up everybody's eyes a little bit because testicular cancer doesn't run in my family. Um, so I really had no reason to think I would ever get it. And here I am at 29 years old. Is it something that you check for regularly? Because I know I'm, I'm bad for it. You know, I, I don't check and monitor these type of things. The, I mean, the only reason I checked was because I had some pain and had I not had that pain, I, I still don't know if I would know about it. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, you know, the testicular cancer society, I've kind of connected with them and, and doing some stuff with them. It's recommended for any male over the age of 20 years old to check once a month. Really? Um, and doing these checks, it's honestly, it takes 15 seconds. Typically the best time to do it is in the shower or after the shower, because, you know, obviously we know warmth relaxes the testicles and that's when you're going to get the best feel. And all you have to do is just take usually your middle and pointer finger and your thumb and just kind of rub the testicle through, um, feeling for any ir irregularities. You know, I think as men, we are all very well in tune with our genitals <laughs> and, <laughs> We should know what it all feels like. Yeah. And you, you'll know pretty quickly when something doesn't feel right. And like I said, with me, it's not like I noticed this big mass. It, it honestly felt like like a, a hard string kind of just in there. And I noticed that that was a little bit off and was just enough to raise some flags. So, you know, especially with testicular cancer, if you can catch it early, the outcomes are absolutely awesome. Well, to, to see you, I mean, you look great. <laughs> like you, 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 look, you don't look so, like someone that's just been through surgery. You're looking good. You're looking fit and healthy. Obviously, you know, we know it's going to be a while till you're back training properly. But um, other than, than surgery, I think you're looking, you know, in a good place right now. Yeah. And to be honest, the, the procedure was a lot easier than I thought it would be. It was, I think it was only about an hour for the entire thing for them to do. And the hardest part was I had to wait almost a full week for the pathology report to come back because that was what, that was going to dictate the treatment moving forward. Right. So there's, there's really three things they look for with testicular cancer. There's the two main types are seminomas and non-seminomas. And then that makes up about 95% of testicular cancers. And then they group everything else into other, which is just not common. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate enough to have a seminoma, which is a, there's a less chance of metastasis with this cancer. It's much less aggressive and is typically localized. Okay. So that means since that's what I had as a stage one seminoma, um, you know, the, the best news ever was I don't need any further treatment. So moving forward, it's just, it's You've got the routine blood now. work. Yeah. So it's routine blood work, routine scans for the next few years, just to make sure nothing else pops up. But other than that, I'm good, you know, which is, which is honestly the best case scenario because there were other scenarios that if it was a more advanced stage of cancer or a different type of cancer, that even with the surgery, I was going to have to go through chemo and radiation. And while I absolutely would have done it, you know, it just <laughs> would have sucked. Yeah. So the fact that I got, you know, the best of the worst case scenarios really is huge and a massive sigh of relief. That's, that's awesome. news. I bet for, for Joey and, you know, family and friends as well, it's, you know, I know so many people, you've got so many fans now, um, you, you kind of, you're very, very well liked in the strongman community anyway. So, you know, all of us were hoping and praying, but it's good to just chat with you today. And, you know, I know we've chatted, you know, off, off camera and stuff, but it's good. Yeah. To, I'm sure so many people are going to be pleased to see that as bad as it was, it could have been so much worse. And, and now you can focus on, on the positives coming back 2022 and, you know, showing us all what you can do in the strongman circuit again. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm so excited to get back at it and like actually have a uninterrupted training cycle and really get after it. Um, you know, gearing up for the Rogue is going to be a lot of fun. You know, 10 of 10 of the best guys are coming coming to Austin, Texas to, to throw down at that contest. When, when's, uh, the, when's the Rogue? That's the last weekend of October, and it, it's the biggest prize purse in Strongman history. So they're putting up, it's 100 grand for first place at that nice. show. Nice. Uh, I think it's, and that I know top three off the top of my head is a hundred grand for first 50 for second, 30 for third. Awesome. Um, and then the payout is down from there, you know, paying all 10 athletes. It's a huge weekend with the CrossFit competition. They're also bringing in, I, 
I'm not sure if they're bringing in both, but they're bringing one of the one of the either powerlifting or Olympic lifting as well. Yeah, they do um, so of, really is turning different sports at the event. It sounds it sounds amazing. I think there's some good opportunities in general right now for strongman. I mean, tell me about you know your, your decision to pull out of Worlds because I know it's hard when you're the alternate. You kind of you don't train with that same kind of intensity that you do when you go in there knowing you've got that place. So was it an easy decision to pull out? Um, yes and no. So I had known that I wasn't going to be getting a spot at Worlds a few weeks prior to the announcements coming out. Yeah. Um, I had a conversation with with Colin about it. And he had called me and very candidly just said, listen, we have spots for six Americans. Um, there's a lot of really good, healthy guys right now. And I, I just wouldn't feel right giving it to you, you know, who's coming off this injury um, you know, and, and taking one of the spots, which to be honest, I agreed with, I understood where he was coming from Yeah. until the athletes got announced. And I saw that there were eight Americans on the list. Um, two of which, uh, you know, I felt, you know, didn't, shouldn't have gotten a spot, you know, quite frankly, you know, uh, one of whom I love and adore, but has not been around for that. For Well, he's been, he was around for a long time, took a long break and then came back. Um, the other one I can't stand. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, names, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's, you know, I think people can work it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you and I can't even really talk to him because we're both blocked on social media. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, to be honest, I had an issue with that. Um, with, with two of those athletes getting the invite over me in a spot where um, my performance at Bahrain was used against me, saying because I didn't perform that well, um, you know, they felt that I wasn't ready. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we all know I, I had two weeks notice for that competition. So uh, it is what it is. And so I was given the, the choice of an alternate and Initially, I had taken it, but then I actually received a call to to shoot a pilot show for for a major network here in the U.S. And it was happening on that same weekend. To be honest, the pay was 10 times more than I was going to make at World's Strongest Man as an alternate. It was a much shorter travel schedule. It was only two and a half days as opposed to a week, uh, almost two full weeks. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I, I this, you know, to all the athletes listening, I, I apologize that it makes me sound like an asshole, but it was just a better move for me. Yeah. Um, I never thought that I would pass up the chance to go to world's strongest man, but, you know, after my injury and kind of putting things into a bigger picture and just kind of the way I was treated for world's strongest man in general, I decided to kind of take that leap of faith and, and kind of branch out to a different audience, I guess is another way to put it right. You know, I'm, I'm very well known in the strongman community already and to get my reach out to a bigger global reach is something that I'm focusing on a little bit right now. And this opportunity just came at the right time. So it was an amazing event. Uh, I literally, I'll give you a little hint at what I did. I got to lift an elevator full of people. Okay. <laughs> um, so literally had, I was standing on a platform 30 feet in the air and holding on, I was strapped into a bar and my feet that I had to do was hold on to the elevator as long as I could while people were getting on. Okay. So it was getting progressively <laughs> heavier the entire time. That's cool. Um, I ended up holding over 600 kilos. So it was pretty oh, badass. Yeah. <laughs> it was very cool and super dramatic because then I just dropped it and the people in the elevator fell down. Um, <laughs> so very, very animated, very cool. So that's being pitched to, to uh, one of the networks here in the U S so this is for a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just the initial pilot um, with the, you know, with the expectation that if it gets picked up, I'll be brought back on for the full show and, and get to do some some cool stuff uh, for awesome. TV. Well, if it all comes out, make sure you let us know so we can we can all watch. Absolutely, no. It was it was not, it was honestly a great time. I definitely had some FOMO missing out on everybody at Worlds. I think, you know, I think especially for you, Laws, just the people that we are. The hardest part about missing out on contests is just not seeing our friends. Yeah. Um, you know, that's I think I missed that more than actually competing this year, which to me makes it the right decision that I wasn't there. Yeah. Is it, people always ask me if I want to go back to Worlds, and, and I, I don't. But when I watch it and I see all the guys, you know, I want to sort of be there involved because I've, I, I did 11 years there. Yeah. And it's it's hard then to sort of just sit back and watch. And it, it, it's strange because 
now watching from home following a spreadsheet like everyone has to it's very weird because i've never i've never had that when i was younger i just used to watch at christmas time when you know that was the way it was um and then I've been an athlete, so I've been there watching it or, or competing in it for, for the last what, 11, 12 years. So to, to be at home and, and understand what the partners go through if they can't come and watch uh, and the fans watching back home, it's a completely different experience. And I think some of the, the organizers don't appreciate that. No. You know, I've, I've spoken to Colin many times and, and Colin's got some great ideas for Strongman. He really does. And, and without Colin, Strongman would have died. So, you know, I, th he, I think he deserves a lot of credit, but there's things that need to change. Absolutely. And, you know, we we had so much interest in what was going on with Worlds. <laughs> I know you, massive. Guys, you guys get to watch it in a few days, but we still have to wait till Christmas over here. Oh, gosh. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I hit refresh on that Google spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, all weekend, I was just clicking that refresh button, trying to figure it out, you know, and see, see where everything was at. It was great fun, but it has to change. We, we need better than this, you know? And yeah, I think it just comes down to... Um, I mean, just how the event is run needs to change. You know, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, you've been saying it for years, how worlds need to be run, you know, 20 athletes, everybody goes against each other, you know, and then you whittle down the field from there, all the same events, you know, you can turn that into a spectacle. And I think that's what needs to be done. I think it can be that there's always, you know, pros and cons to any way that you run a contest, but I think there's, there's certainly things that can be tried and, and changed. Um, but more than anything, just getting it out quicker or, or if it can't be live as near to live as possible. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I think if we're going to get the sport to, to the masses, which we're seeing great growth, you know, if you look at, I mean, you, you're talking there about trying to build your own brand, really, I guess, earlier, as well as obviously being a great strong man. You, you're trying to do this for a living now. So you, it's about you know, reaching out to more people and, and this TV opportunity was, was a bigger opportunity at the end of the day. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, and it's and selfishly for me, it was, but also looking at the bigger picture of the sport in general, mm. you know, if, if they see me on a major network competing in a, in a game show, then it's going to bring more people over to the strongman side of things as well and get yeah. them involved. Look at the, um, the, event, the TV program on the history channel. The, the, with the, exactly. The guys. That's the, that, that was huge for the sport. It brought a lot yeah. more new fans in. Guys with big YouTube channels like Eddie and, and Brian Shaw, they, they, they've brought a lot more fans into the sport. And, you know, it's, it's, it's growing all the time. We just need to keep it, keep turning it out and, and hope that eventually World's Strongest Man listen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the only thing we can do is be as loud and obnoxious as possible about it. So <laughs> I, I think we're doing a good job so far. Yeah, well, I'm not going to compete again at Worlds, so <laughs> I get in trouble for what I might say. But I don't, and I genuinely, I don't, I don't want to badmouth them because I think Worlds is a great show. I just want to see it get better. That's all I want. I want better opportunities for the athletes. I want the fans to keep coming into the sport, keep enjoying it and not look at it as one TV show once a year. Yes, Let's yes. make the whole sport bigger. Have multiple events throughout the year. You know, it's not about one show that happens at Christmas time, which is their no. mentality still. Absolutely. I mean, and we're seeing it with the growth of these different organizations with Wuss and the Arnold, you know, Rogue putting out these bigger events, bigger prize purses. And, you know, obviously we all get into the sport because of the title of World's Strongest Man. Um, and it's still the most prestigious title to win, but everybody else is stepping up their games and the production value and things are changing. You know, we, I think we're, we're definitely seeing a shift from these other organizations and I want to see world's strongest man, you know, change with the times and really make these adjustments to bring more people in because I mean, what uh, this year at worlds, they opened it up to fans, I think two days before the contest started and it was sold out in the first day. Yeah. for ticket sales for fans to come and, watch. and they could they could have sold so many more tickets oh it could have been massive mm -hmm. and i think they got their first glimpse of that in 2019 in bradenton um because the the fan base was amazing in florida that year and i think they're finally starting to catch on i hope they are i think they are i mean you've been over to the uk for the the live events we do here but the fan base in the states now is getting huge it's massive getting bigger all the time you know, I'd say over half of my fan base are now American, which is, yeah, it's, it's amazing, really, because I know a lot of the big events that I've done aren't shown in America. 
So it's only really from my YouTube and social media side of things that people are seeing what we do. Um, so. And I think we're starting to see the willingness from, I mean, I think the, the fear was always like Americans aren't going to be willing to travel to a big show within the U.S. And I think that's starting to change. Mm -hmm. You know, when Worlds first got announced for Sacramento, there was, I mean, starting Strongman, there was threads, pages long about people asking, how can they get tickets? They want to book a trip, like all this stuff. So I think we're going to see, you know, like you said, the fan base is growing and the willingness for people to travel to see some of these events now is becoming a little bit more. Yeah. I think, it, I think as long as characters keep being involved in the sport, people keep pushing it, we should be able to keep it growing. And I just hope World's Strongest Man help that at least. Yeah, rather than, absolutely. Rather than hold it back, you know. Well, I'm excited to get back there in 2022 and make another push for the finals because I've been close three damn times and I want that spot finally. Three times you've been in the heats and, and not made the final yet. Yeah, you got to get into that final, man. <laughs> well, tell that to Luke Stoltman. He fucked me over the first time. <laughs> what did you think of the Stoltmans this year? Uh, it was so much fun to watch. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was so cool. You know, I'm I'm obviously extremely close with both of those boys. And, and to see them come through, you know, I was so excited for Luke to make it through that group because that was one hard group to make it through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with him, Bobby Tomskin, Novikov, Kevin Fairs. I mean, it was just stacked. And, um, you know, to see him back in the finals again and then obviously to see Tom on top of the podium was just absolutely amazing. You know, they work so hard and, and to see it really pay off for them this year was awesome. What I love about both of them is they're extremely hardworking, but just two genuinely decent guys. Yeah, they, I mean, I think I talk to them probably at least once a week <laughs> you know, between the both of them. And they just, they just have these massive hearts that are just so evident. You know, I mean, it's whether you see them training or just see their videos that they put up every week, it's just you can tell that they are just genuinely caring guys, which is just so nice, especially to see them succeed so much. You see that that confidence in them is growing all the time. I, I think Tom is going to be a nightmare now for anyone. Yeah, he's a bastard. He's He just seems to have this extra confidence in himself all of a sudden. And that's, I guess that was the one thing that was lacking a little bit for, for a couple of years. Tom, confident believing in himself is a scary, scary thought. And Luke yeah, seems to get better every single year. You see it, I think the scary thing is they, they keep making their weaknesses not so weak. You know, I mean, you're just seeing these guys that are just more well-rounded every single time they step out onto that field. And, you know, I think you, you talk about just like determination and focus. You know, I feel like they're just these guys that they have this like laser focus and this tunnel vision that one, once it gets in their head, it's not going anywhere. I'd be interested. I, I want to talk to Luke and kind of, see what his goals are now, whether he believes he can win World's Strongest Man. Because He's close. Well, he, he, could, he could have been third this year. You know, if yeah, absolutely. Mess up on the stones, he had a chance of being in the top three. If you can get in the top three, you can win. It's, yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. So it's, uh, and obviously he trains with his brother every day. He knows he can beat him on things. It's, um, it, it'll be interesting to see what they're interesting. Like. Interesting to see if their coach Dan is going to have a conflict now, though, because he's coaching <laughs> both of them. <laughs> well, they, they work well as a team, but they do. Yeah, it, it's it's a weird one when you, you're coaching two people like that. Because obviously, I think I think the more surprising thing besides Tom winning was Novikov not even making it to the finals. Yeah, you know, I mean, that just goes to show at at how strange this sport is because we can always see who's dominant and who's doing well, but it really just leads it up to the fact that on any given day, anybody can win. You know, I mean, I was fortunate enough to win the Arnold Australia back in 2019, but had I had no expectation of doing so when I showed up at the contest. I was just hoping to get some points and go to more Arnolds that year. And it's just absolutely wild to see how the tables turn so quickly for each athlete. I think we're at a stage now as well where – Pretty much everyone that competes is, is, you know, world class. And then behind that, you've got, I mean, there's only 25 guys that can go to World's Strongest Man, but you have maybe 75 other guys around the world that are all good enough to be there as well. Yeah, it's, I think this is absolutely the deepest the field has ever been in the sport, which is so exciting. When you think of all the names that could have been competing, 
you know, you, you just have to look on social media and see the numbers that people are lifting. And you go to different comps and you see results. And, and, and you know, places ch chop and change all the time in these contests. I mean, Absolutely. Tom, what was Tom in Bahrain? About eighth? I think eighth, yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, seventh, eighth, yeah, it was right around there. It's, it's, and Novikov won that show. Yeah. Easily. I mean, he looks incredible. <laughs> It's just, yeah, it's it's a really amazing time to be both a competitor and a fan of the sport right now, um, just to be able to see kind of where it's going to go over the next few years. How how high is the standard going to get? And what's it like for you? I as don't well? want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, you're still in your prime. You know, I know you've gone through a bit of a, a rough spell, but I, I'd say I, I got to my best from 30 to sort of 34, 35, and then you know, it slows down a little, but yes. <laughs> you're not even at 30 yet. You know, you've got your best years still to come. So, but you're one of the smallest guys to compete at this level. You know, these, these freaky monsters keep coming in. Do you, do you ever think about that? Or is it just always focusing on, on you being better? Uh, no, I definitely do think about it, but it, uh, to me, it's never, I guess I look at it more as a, as a motivator, as opposed to something that's going to defeat me. You know, I talk about this a lot and like how I got to this point in my career. It was just by setting these attainable goals that I know I can achieve. And since 2019, I've had the two same goals. I want to make the finals at Worlds and top five at the Arnold. Until I do that, those things aren't going to change. And I know I'm capable of both. You know, I mean, I just barely missed out on the finals at, at Worlds in 2019. Um, and at the Arnold in 2020, I took sixth instead of fifth. So I know I can do both of those things. Once I do that, then it's going to be more about getting some trophies and getting on the podium at these shows, which I still think I'm capable of, you know, given the right day um, and, and how I'm feeling, I, I absolutely think that I'm capable of getting on the podium at, at any of the biggest shows in the world. I think that's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, it's turning up to the competition in shape, having the right events for you, you know, trying to eliminate any weaknesses so that then you don't have those fluctuating, you know, that's when you, when you look at guys like normal, I'd say normally Novikov is so consistent, but guys like Brian Shaw, JF Caron, you know, Zadrunas, absolutely. Thor, those kind of guys, they were always scoring well. That's... I just got to make sure I don't get a keg toss. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have liked that in the final then this year. I would have hated that. <laughs> <laughs> what about log for Max? That would have been a bit more up your street. You know, it's still, that's still a testy subject for me. Um, you know, since my tricep injury, my log is not, not the same whatsoever. Um, I haven't been able to split jerk since it. Um, and it's, I'm really struggling. You know, I've hit, I've pressed 186 on an axle. Yeah. And I can barely press 140, 145 right now on a log. Really? Yeah. There's just, there's just this unbelievable disconnect that's going on right now that it's very obviously I'm, I'm at a bigger setback now because of this, of this surgery that I just had. So it gives me, you know, takes me away from the log for about six weeks, but even up until this point, it's just, uh, it's been a battle just trying to get back to it. Yeah. I think it's one of the things I, I learned over the years getting injured. I then had to adapt how I did things. So if I kind of watch my early lifting compared to how I lift now, I'm a different lifter. You know, I can't do some of the stuff that I used to be able to do. And I've had to, you know, I, I was, I was pretty explosive in terms of my overhead lifting at one point, whereas now I'm a lot stronger. You know, I can strict press a lot more than I used to, but I'm not as good at say my push press or, or jerk type movements. It, it's funny how injuries do make you have to adapt and, and learn new ways to do things. But you know, I'm sure you'll, you'll get it all back. It's, so it's only been a, less than a year. Yeah. It hasn't even been a year. It's um, let's see, next month will be nine months. It, it, it does take time, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I look at Janashi, it took him two years to get back to the point where he could press a dumbbell, you know, a 200, a hundred kilo dumbbell with that, with that injured arm. So of it is the psychological side of things. It's, you know, I'll tell you, I, I went to um, an acupuncturist for, to work on my scar and I was telling her all of these issues that I was having. She's like, okay, let's see what we can find out. So she decided to test my core strength. Sitting there, totally fine. Core was really strong. Then she said, think about doing a log press. Okay. <laughs> I was, I closed my eyes and I envisioned myself doing a log press. 
I couldn't activate my core. Was she pushing you over? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And she's, she was a very tiny woman. Um, but it was just, it, so there, there is this, there's this mental barrier that I haven't worked through yet with this movement um, in order to really, you know, get back to where I was before. And that's just something I have to continually work through. You know, I think my body probably when I get the log onto my chest is probably saying, what the F man, you got hurt last time you did this. <laughs> and it's, it's just kind of turning it's everything that voice off. in the back of your head. And it, it is hard to turn off, but it's doable. You, 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 Absolutely. You, you just got to be smart and, and take your time. Yeah. And that's what I've learned is, you know, not trying to load up the log super heavy every time I'm in there. Cause then I just get frustrated. Right. So now I'm focusing on, let's just have good workouts. So if that means if that means I'm doing 110 on that day for for a bunch of reps, then that's what I do, and it's totally fine to be able to walk out of the gym and and be in a good mood after a good log press session, is more is is worth more than anything right now. I totally agree, and I'm not saying this because I, I know you know this, but more for people watching, if you have had an injury, you have to separate what you used to be able to do. And it, it becomes, it, it almost becomes like starting from scratch again. You got like pre, you know, before your injury and then after the injury, they're, they're separate PBs and you have to kind of focus on where you're at now rather than where you were. And it's a very difficult thing to do. But if you keep thinking about what you used to be able to do, you will keep failing because you're trying to do too much weight. Your, your technique breaks down. You have to have the foresight to understand that, You've, you've got to start from scratch and you can get back to that best, but it just takes time like it did in the first place to build it. You, you, you can't keep rushing it. And it's, you know, if you think of your tricep, you've had it operated on. It's not the same as it was, no. you know, it might be strong and it's fixed, but the, the movement is going to be slightly different. It's going to be tighter. It's, you know, there's different elements there that are going to get, take time to get used to. And it's, it's one of those things that is very difficult for a lot of people to mentally grasp. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that was a big learning experience for me coming out of the injury is, you know, I used to correlate a good workout with just like absolutely crushing it, hitting massive weights and feeling torn down and beat down, <laughs> you know, tired and exhausted. Um, and now I, I look at my good workouts as, you know, what did I accomplish during that session? Yeah. Right. You know, so especially looking at anything upper body, whether I'm bench pressing or log pressing or doing axle, it doesn't really matter as long as I got the work in that day, then I'm happy because I know it's just, it's, it's just stepping stones to get back to where I was. You know, it's extremely disheartening stepping into a workout, pressing a hundred kilos less than I used to be able to, but I know it's necessary in order for me to get back to that point when I want to. The good thing is you are still more than young enough and fit enough to, to get back to, to your best and beyond. It's just a that's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> tell, tell me then the plan going forward. Obviously, this year you got the Rogue Invitational, but the next sort of year or two, what's the focus for you in Strongman and outside of Strongman? You know, in Strongman, it's definitely um, you know I, the big question mark is who's going to be at the Arnold? Because um, obviously, it didn't happen this year. The plan, if it were to happen this year, was they were going to take the top six from 2020 as automatic invites, obviously the winner from the Arnold amateur, there's seven. Then there were going to be three wild cards. As of right now, the Arnold 2022 is invite only. Okay. So we have no idea who they're going to be choosing as those 10 athletes. Mm. Um, so that opens up the door to a lot that we don't know because of COVID, you know, still being active in a lot of places of the world, are they going to have the same qualification standards for the Arnold moving forward? What's yeah. going to change? I mean, there's, there's a lot to go over. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's, I, I still have those same goals that I talked about and that's going to be top 10 at worlds top five at the Arnold. And um, the same thing at the Wuss shows is going to be, you know, top five at every show. You know, that's really my goal is don't place, le don't place less than five um, really moving forward. And then from there, then it's going to be, you know, going after trophies. But, you know, for me, I, I see myself really being competitive and staying in this sport for at least five to six more years at this level, really pushing and going for everything that I can. Um, you know, that's the conversation that Joey and I have always had is, you know, when I hit like that 35 mark, that's when I'm going to kind of evaluate where I'm at in my career and strongman and decide to take a step back um, if, 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 it's the, if it's my time. 
you know, who knows? I might be riding a high at that point and doing really well. So I want to stay in it. But, um, you know, that's going to be kind of my, my marker to, to evaluate where we're at in life and in my career to make a decision going forward. Do you have goals outside of Strongman that you're focused on? You know, for me, outside of Strongman, it's um, it's really just about a lot of the advocacy stuff that I'm doing with the LGBTQ plus community now, along with the Testicular Cancer Society, uh, trying to bring awareness to that. You know, uh, I'm working right now, have a great job working at a, uh, at a physio clinic. So really, really happy to be doing that. So my schedule's great. I'm able to get all my training in. Um, you know, life is just good right now, feeling really fulfilled in every aspect. So I don't know if there's really any changes from that that I'm going to be doing, um, just because I'm able to juggle everything right now and keep moving forward with it. That's brilliant, man. It's great to hear you. After everything you've been through in this last year, you still sound so positive. You're doing a lot of great things. And I think, you know, we all look forward to seeing you competing again. I'm excited. You know, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, especially getting this diagnosis just a few weeks ago, it's, I tried not to dwell on it and be upset about it because, you know, stressing about stuff like this isn't going to change the outcome. Right. So for me, it was always the mindset of, okay, this is, this, it is what it is. Um, how do we move on from this? How do we, how do we turn it into something better? And I think, you know, just being very open about my, my journey with cancer and how I found it and just, trying to be, you know, make everybody aware um, of how I noticed it and to just be checking yourselves because it's a lot more common than we thought. So just trying to, you know, do use it for a little bit of good when I can. Good man. Well, I'm going to go and have a shower and check myself out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have too much fun. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. It's always good to catch up. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you back in action soon. All right. Thanks so much, Laz. I appreciate it, man. Everyone, make sure you go follow Mr. Rob Kearney. Absolutely one of the best strong men on the planet and an awesome guy. Best of luck with your recovery. We will see you soon, my friend. Appreciate it. While you're here, guys, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my awesome strength content.